Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. Tonight's message, as I mentioned earlier, is not a pleasant theme for any preacher to speak on. No preacher takes any kind of pleasure, I suppose, is the word to share on the subject, but it's absolutely essential and so important for us to understand about this subject of hell. You know, this morning I preached on the love of God, and I said that it was like two sides of God's, God's love and his mercy and his goodness, his unlimited, unending, unfailing, unconditional, demonstrated love that he gave to us and showed us in Jesus. But there's also the other side of the coin of God's justice and his wrath and his punishment for those who reject the truth of the gospel. And I shared the message on God's love this morning just to prepare our hearts for what's coming tonight. I have a a book, one of these, what they call a coffee table book, you know, the kind of books that I mean. It's called Ambassador for Christ. It's the story of Billy Graham and lots of photographs in it. And when I opened it, when I was first given it and I opened the front page, it had a quote from Billy Graham and it was this, my one purpose in life is to help people find a personal relationship with God, which I believe comes through knowing Jesus Christ. That is our purpose in life, to bring people to Jesus, to bring them Bring them to Christ. This message is not palatable word for any preacher really, but it is essential for Adam's race to hear, central to the whole purpose of why Christ came to earth and fundamental belief and doctrine of the word of God in the Christian faith. It is of course the subject of hell. It is normally my practice to give my message is a title. I didn't know how to kind of title this one, but just simply a question. Why go to hell? Why go to hell? Why choose to go to hell? So I'm going to read some scriptures, and then we're going to ask and answer five questions. And they're going to be difficult to look at, but we're going to end on a positive as well tonight, so don't worry. We're not going to, I'm not going to leave you dangling over the fires and the sulfur. uh, But I'm going to read these um, passages to you. And for the sake of time and for the points I'm going to make, I won't be given, you know, references and scriptures and everything and things that, as as I tell you about what hell is and what it's not, um, you will know yourselves from scriptures that you have probably read over the years, we're going to take four passages to read a few verses from each passage. The first one's found in Luke chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse 19. And this is, of course, the parable in which Jesus is speaking about the rich man and Lazarus. And Jesus is speaking, and he says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even dogs came and licked his sores. And the time came when the beggar died, and angels carried him to Abraham's side. Then the rich man also died and was buried in hell, in hell, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the f- his tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross from there to here. Now just pause for a second. There's not such a thing as purgatory. It does not exist. There's heaven and there's hell. There's nothing in between. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to send to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. 
Abraham replied, they have Moses, they have the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. That's almost a prophetic, that is a prophetic statement. And I'm going to flip over to Revelation chapter 20 and reading from verse 11. When I saw, then I saw the great white throne and him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that they were in them. And each person was judged according to what he'd done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And then flicking back to 2 Thessalonians chapter one, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church at the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Second Thessalonians chapter one. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so because your faith is growing more and more and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith and in, uh, in all the persecutions and trials that you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to those who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed, which includes you because you have believed our testimony to you. And with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling, that by his power, he will fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that in the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last of my foundational scriptures is a famous verse in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has chosen not to believe in the name of God's one and only son. I am 60 years of age. I got saved at the age of 23. And for years I have heard preachers who oppose the message of hell saying things like this. We've had too much of hellfire preaching. We won't win people to Christ by preaching hell and judgment. We shouldn't scare people into the kingdom by preaching hell, etc., etc. The problem is that having been saved in 1987... 37 years, I have been in church at least once a week for 37 years and many times more. I've listened to literally thousands of messages on CD, TV, DVD, online, etc. And apart from those who I have chosen to download and listen to, I have never, ever heard any preacher preach on hell, ever. That's my personal testimony. It might not be yours, but that's mine. 37 years saved. I've never gone to a church service and heard a preacher preach on hell. So I don't quite know 
where people get this idea that there's all this hellfire preaching going on in our nation. When was the last time you heard a message on hell? Now, I know that Arthur doesn't mince his words, so you probably hear it a lot more than most people do, but I want to tell you, as someone who travels the length and breadth of, the Sco- of Scotland across all the denominations, that is not the normal. And yet, listen to some of these statistics on hell. Just a few for you to ponder. The Bible refers to hell 167 times. Jesus preached on hell more than he did on heaven. Jesus preached on it approximately 33 times in the three years that he ministered. And the interesting thing is, the challenging thing is, he predominantly spoke to his own disciples about hell, not the lost. His own disciples. So I kind of conclude from that. I, 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 I look at that and think about that and I kind of conclude, why would Jesus? Jesus always taught security in him, absolute security of salvation in him. Why would he say so many times and speak to his disciples so many times about the subject of hell? And this is my own opinion and I stress it's my opinion. My opinion is he wants us to understand the brevity of the job that God has given to his disciples. That we are not playing at church. We're not playing at churchianity. We are battling for the souls of men and women and young people in our nation. He gave absolute assurance of salvation in him. So why would he speak so often on hell to his own disciples? So I don't know where these anti-hell protagonists get the idea that the church is in deluge with preachers who have preached hellfire and damnation. I don't know what they're talking about. And I understand ministers and preachers' aversion to the subject of hell, but considering the volume of mention it gets in virtually all of the writers in the New Testament, many of the Old Testament, and Jesus frequently teaching and referring to it, we must resurrect this vital warning of judgment and include it in our belt of truth in our arsenal of weapons when we are going out to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's like if you saw a blind man, we, were, we were, had a nice sort of drive around and seen a lovely countryside around and, and uh, just recently I was um, on the, the coast and there was cliffs on the coast and if you could imagine a blind man just, just foolishly just walking towards the end uh, of a cliff to the edge of a cliff and with his stick and he's wandering and wondering, would you not shout and warn him? Be careful, be warned, turn around, turn around. You're going to fall. You're going to tip into the pit. We are told to share the gospel. It says that we are to warn people of the wrath to come. It was part of Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. It says specifically that he warned people of the wrath that was to come. But don't mention God's wrath in the church. My goodness, how dare you do that? This message is by no means an exhaustive study on hell. And in fact, it's more a general overview given to help us see the importance of the job that God has given to us and the fact that judgment is coming to this world. Nobody, but nobody gets away with anything. I'm not going to entertain you tonight. I will not be giving illustrations and stories as I normally do. Because I want scripture and the facts of what hell is to speak to us directly tonight. So I'm going to ask four questions, not five. Number one, why is there a hell? Why is there a hell? Why would a loving God create a hell? Number two, who goes to hell? Who actually goes to hell? I'm using my phone here as well because some of my notes are so scribbled I can't even read my own writing. Number three, what is hell like? Number four, where is hell? And the five question, actually there is a five questions. How can we be saved from hell? How can we be saved from hell? So firstly, why is there a hell? The Bible teaches us that God created man in his own image. 
In fact, in actual reality, he only created Adam in his image because after Adam and Eve conceived, all the rest of mankind were sinners. But Adam, when he was created, was created in the image of God. But let's not get into theological T's and dots. But when he created Adam, he formed a muddy body and the Bible says that he breathed the breath of life into Adam. So this is how I see it. This is how I see it in my mind's eye. That God, after he created this muddy body of Adam, literally condescended to breathe the breath of life. Roach is the word. The breath of the Spirit is the same word. Into Adam. And it says that Adam stood up a living soul, a living being. No animal, no bird, no fish, nothing else in all creation had the breath of God in his lungs and the life of God in his lungs. So Adam was created in the image of God unlike anything else in all creation. Created in God's image. But he was created spirit, he was created soul, and he was created body. And we know from our Study in Genesis and our knowledge of the scriptures that God put a, a, a tree in the garden, one tree, one thing he forbade Adam and Eve to do was to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it says that Eve ate of the tree because the, the devil, the serpent deceived her, but then she gave it to her husband. And when her husband took it, they both became sinners and aware of their sin. It's funny that Eve wasn't aware of anything. But she was deceived. Adam disobeyed God directly. And he was actually with her when Satan deceived Eve. It says that after she tasted it and saw it was good, she gave some to her husband who was with her, the Bible says. He should have stopped it immediately, but he didn't. And when that happened, he became a sinner, was aware of his nakedness. He was separated from his environment, separated from God, separated in his own mind because he was naked and he was ashamed. He was separated from his wife because he blamed her for what had happened. And this separation took place. Sin came into the world and separated man from his creator. Separated man from his creator. Now, we read prior to that, and I don't have time to go into a lot of depth in this, but if you read in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 19, you read about the fall of Lucifer. Lucifer was an archangel. So there was, there was Gabriel, there was Michael, and there was Lucifer. By inference, there were three archangels, and Lucifer was a worship leader. He was found with pride. He was cast out of heaven, cast onto the earth. He became known as Satan. And it was Satan who inhabited the serpent, who deceived Eve, who subsequently caused Adam to sin. And sin came into the world. But the Bible tells us very clearly that hell was created for Satan and for his demons. The scripture says that when God cast Lucifer out of heaven, he took a third of the angels with him. And again, that infers that they were Three archangels over three groups of. I want to encourage you with that for a start because we get so wound up about demons and wickedness and the evil, but there are twice as many angels that are with us and th than those who are against us. Amen. <laughs> Two to one. Twice as many. But the problem was because, I mean, God created the world good, He created Adam good, He created Eve good. But then sin came in, and because of that, Adam became a sinner. Eve became a sinner. Their children became sinners. First man ever born killed his brother. And then we have this corruption that we are here today. The earth, I will curse the earth because of you, God said. So the earth was cursed. All this thing about the environment and everything else. You can stop driving your cars. You can stop spraying your hair, ladies. You can do all of that. But I tell you, it will make very little difference to the corruption that's in this world. Because this world in its present form is passing away. Very quickly now. Very quickly. It's passing away. So sin affected everything in creation. And Adam became a sinner. Everything that God created good was now tainted. Now, angels, good and bad, are eternal. Man are also eternal. When you die, we just put off. This body is in a state of corruption. We just One day we die, the body 
goes to the earth, but the spirit and the soul are reunited to God. And when they're reunited to God, they go to one of either two places. And I don't want to get into a whole lot of theological things about it all, but in the end, and just to cut it all, to, to cut to the chase, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. That's it. There's nothing in between. You go to heaven and you go to hell. And man, every man, woman, and child on this planet since Adam, none of them are dead. They are dead in body, but they live eternally. And every single person will either spend eternity in heaven or in hell. In heaven or in hell. But what determines where we go? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think it right and just that God would have good and evil dwelling together for eternity? I mean, it's bad enough that we've got this for, I don't know how many centuries or how many thousand years the world is, is in age. It's bad enough the mess we've got into now. But eternally, eternity? The answer of it, of course not. So God created heaven for the righteous and he created hell for the unrighteous. Heaven for the just, hell for the unjust. Heaven for the good, hell for the evil. And this is very important. There's a great distinction between angels and man because angels were created beings. Man was created in the image of God and had the breath of God in it. Angels were given a one-off chance to choose right. And a third of them chose to go with Lucifer, fallen and now become Satan. And two-thirds chose to stay with God and to be servants to us here on earth. They were given a choice, but it was one-off. But men and women, we still have the chance to choose there's no chance now for the angels. It's done and dusted. A third away in hell will be eventually. Two thirds eternally with God. But when it comes to mankind, every man, woman, and child has the opportunity while they are alive and living to choose to receive salvation through the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, laying down his life for us. So hell was created by God as an eternal abode for demons, punishment for Satan and his angels, but also for those men and women who refuse to repent of their sins and put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible was clear about that distinction. Only those, as a friend of mine said, Angus Buchan, some of you might have read his book, Faith Like Potatoes, he said, there are no good people in heaven, only born again believers. And that's the truth, friend. You have to be born again of the Spirit of God. Evil will not dwell with the righteous. You imagine the apostle Peter living in harmony with Adolf Hitler. I don't think so. Living eternally forever, I do not think so. A man who laid down his life for Jesus and the gospel and the betterment of mankind and people around him to a murderous, crazy, despot, demon-possessed. No, there's a distinction between good and evil angels, but there's also a distinction between good and evil men and women, those who reject the gospel. Heaven is for the righteous. Hell is for the unrighteous. Amen. Is that clear as we start this evening? To lighten the mood just for a moment. I remember hearing a story of this lady who had died and she went to heaven and went to the pearly gates. And when she got there, Peter was there and said, oh, hello, how are you? And how's your name? What's your name? And said, oh, yeah. And she said, oh, can I go in? She said, well, uh, Peter says, you just have to spell a word and you can come in to heaven. And she sort of looked at him and she was a bit kind of, okay, well, what, what word do I have to spell? Spell the word love. And she went, really? Yeah. Okay, L-O-V-E, wonderful, come in. So she came in, she was like, oh, this is awesome, this is great. So Peter says to her, can you just hang on a wee minute? I need just to nip and do a wee errand. So 
As she does, she si- just look after the register, so she's sitting there at the register. As she does, just coming up the corridor, she sees her husband. And she's thinking like, oh my goodness, what's happening here? So he comes up and he looks and he's looking around and he sees his wife and goes, oh my goodness, Marjorie, wow. Wow, look at this place, it's amazing. She says, what happened to you? She said, I was so distraught at your funeral that I had an accident on the way home and I was killed. And she says, oh my goodness, that's terrible. And he looks and says, this is an awesome place. But how do I come into where you are? How do I come in? She said, it's no problem. You just have to spell a word. Oh, that sounds wonderful. What is it? Czechoslovakia. So hell was initially for fallen angel. I wanted to put that in just to lighten the mood a wee bit this evening. Hell is also for the unrepenting and unbelieving men and women. That's how important it is. Only believers, born again believers, will go into heaven. Who goes to hell? The second question. We've already established fallen angels. That's done and dusted. But the Bible says all sinners go to hell. All sinners go to hell. And when you read about some of the examples that Jesus himself gave, you know, the scripture says, all the soul that sins dies. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. And all those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. As Angus Buchan said, good people don't go to heaven, only born again believers. And then Jesus gives us example after example of those who either risk going to hell or will go to hell. And listen to some of the things he says. I tell you the truth, anyone who's angry with his brother and will be subject to judgment, but anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is, uh, is answerable to the, the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. That's in your Bible. That's in my Bible. He said, if your right eye causes you to sin, that's Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, for it's better to remove part of your body than to enter into. Now that's, you know, take that in context. Otherwise, we'll all be eyeless and, and handless. He went on to talk about the unforgiving, the religious hypocrites, those who refuse to repent, those who disobey God. Those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit. The tares that are sown among the wheat. Those who cause others to sin. uh, I.e. drug pushers, pornographers, gang leaders, extortioners, loan sharks. All these kind of people. Those who are not dressed in holy garments. You know, the parable of the wedding feast. The man was not dressed in holy arraignment. He was cast out. He also mentioned the lazy, the sinful servants who neglected their duties to God. Who were parting it up thinking, where is this coming? We'll just, we'll eat, drink and be merry. And forget about everything that he said. Just like this man who has given his life now and traveling with a presentation that Stuart told about this man, this, this conversion therapy play that he's talking about. He even talked about teachers of the laws and rules, blind guides, false messiahs, religious leaders, the unmerciful. These are people and the kind of people that Jesus says will not enter the kingdom of God and risk the fires of hell. And then we have Paul. Paul. And you just have to take my my word for it because, uh, as I say, for the sake of time, I don't have all the scriptures here and the references here for you. But Paul lists the disobedient, the liars, the hypocrites, the drunkards, the immoral, the impure, the false teachers, the greedy, the self-seeking, the arrogant, the unclean, the unholy, homosexual offenders, the rebellious, God-haters, Christ-haters. The Apostle Paul adds idol worshippers, soothsayers, witches, those who practice witchcraft and dark arts, fortune tellers, those who practice magic arts, the immoral, the sexually perverse. In fact, the Bible proclaims that each and every one of us are guilty sinners, the so-called good, the bad, and the ugly, all of us. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all of us, every one of us. And some may be worse than others. And I quoted the quote before A.W. Tozer, one of my famous, uh, fa- favorite writers. He says, you know, when a woman goes and takes the brush and she sweeps out the kitchen, she says, some of the dirt is gray, some of the dirt is brown, some of it is black, but it's all dirt. 
all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I'm sure that even as I read out that list, there are things in our past that we've been guilty that we could have maybe fallen into the same categories. The Bible says that we all like sheep have gone astray. But it goes on to say, the Lord has laid on him, on him, the iniquity of us all. So all of it, the worst filth that you could imagine, the horrors of the Holocaust, all of that, all of the sin of that was laid on Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the spotless one. He who had no sin became sin for us that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So an exchange takes place. So you and I are here tonight, not because you're a good person, not because you read your Bible. I'm sure you're all very nice and very pleasant people. You're not here though because you're, 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 you're not here just because it's, you're you know, attending church. You're here because Jesus saved you and you are right before God because when he took your sin, he gave you his righteousness. So you and I are clothed. That's what Jesus meant when he told about the parable of the wedding feast. When we die, we don't stand before us, God forbid, and try to argue our case about how well we did. We are on our knees and our faces saying, thank you, God, that Jesus Christ became sin for me, that I became the righteousness of God in him. And I stand before you, almighty God, in your judgment and before you, heavenly Father, because I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And he offers it as a free gift to all people, every single one of them, every person out there, everyone. And all we need to do is repent of our sin. But people don't want to repent of their sin. The Bible tells us people love darkness rather than light. And so they love to stay in the darkness and come, rather than come into the light. But if we come into the light as he is in the light, Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sin and makes us brand new creations in Christ Jesus. And you and I stand before God tonight. If you're a born again believer, you stand righteous before God because of him, not because of you. Hallelujah. What a savior. Even when we take communion, do you realize you have no covenant with God whatsoever? I know that might ruffle a few feathers, but you don't have a covenant with God. What covenant are you going to make with God? What covenant am I going to make with God that I can actually keep? There's none. But Jesus made a covenant with his father by laying down his life. And because we are in Christ Jesus, we are totally immersed and covered. And we are in that covenant with him. Not because of your righteousness. Not because of your performance. But because of his performance. And his righteousness. And his sacrifice. And what he did for you. And we forget that sometimes. We get saved. Our lives are changed. We get excited. And then we start to do the legalist thing. Oh, and tick all the book. I must do this. I must pray for somebody. I must do that and do this and do that. And don't do that and don't do that. And we get ourselves into a muddle. And before long, the joy of our salvation is gone. And then God comes along and taps us on the shoulder and points us to the cross there and there and says, my son died for you. He paid the price. Stop it and put your trust in him and walk in his fullness, not yours. And we go, thank you, Lord, for cleansing me and walking in his fullness. Amen. You and I do not need to fear death and the punishment after death because Jesus took the crime, took the punishment for us on our behalf. That's why we love him. That's why we preach him. That's why we live for him. Outside of Christ, there's no forgiveness, no mercy, no repentance, no salvation, no heaven, no hope. It's why you need Jesus. I need Jesus. We need Jesus. They need Jesus. And that's why we're supposed to be grateful, celebratory Christians, not just at Christmas and Easter, but in Sundays and at Pentecost and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and every day of the week. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thirdly, what is hell like? This is difficult to preach. This is difficult, but I'm going to list it for you. I'm just going to tell you these things, and again, you have to just trust and look and consider where these scriptures would be because you will recognize some of these things. Number one, you're alive and cognitive. That parable, people say, a lot of people say it was a parable, you know, the rich man and Lazarus. 
But there are a lot of people, majority of theologians are saying that was a real event. That wasn't a parable because in the parables, God doesn't name the people. Jesus never named the people. He just said, there was a Samaritan. There was a farmer. There was a this. There was a fisherman. There was that. There was the next thing. He actually named these people. And we read in that story of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man was burning in torment in hell. He was cognitive. He was alive. It is eternal. Eternal is a new, it's a new dimension of living, but it's also for eternity. It never, ever, ever, ever stops. Man will never, ever, 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 ever die. There is not oblivion. This doctrine of oblivion is not in the Bible. It's invented by men who want to try and sugarcoat the message of the gospel for people. We live for eternity, all of us, in either heaven or hell. Heaven for those who repent and believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and hell for those who have chosen to reject it and say no to Jesus. There's eternal suffering. There's eternal burning. Fires. There's eternal torture. It talks about torture. There's fire that is never extinguishes. We read about that. Jesus talked about a fire that never goes out. It's utter darkness. There's continual weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus mentioned that. He talked about that. We don't like speaking about these things. I don't like speaking about these things. But they're in our Bible. Along with him healing the sick and raising the dead and the other things he did. He spoke about these things to us to inspire us to warn others and to live for him and for his glory. There's absolutely no fellowship whatsoever. Fire, darkness, pain, gnashing of teeth, and never ever to have fellowship with anyone ever for eternity. I know it's not palatable, I'm sorry. But that's what the Bible teaches. There's no reprieve. It's too late. It is my personal belief that God is a God of mercy and he gives every man and woman and child over a separate age. I believe that babies are all in heaven. Every baby. I mean, it's, abortion is the most heinous crime ever. It's murder. But the only thing about it is that every baby aborted, no matter whether it was just an hour old cell, every single one of them, without exception, are in heaven. <laughs> it's just so amazing that our God would do that. But for man and woman and those who are of the age of understanding, we have to choose to repent, believe, and be saved. And if we die and we have not done that, there's no other re option or reprieve. If you're here today or you're watching or listening online, you've heard the gospel. You've heard you need to repent. And whenever you die and you face God, you will not be able to say, I did not know because I warned you tonight. You've heard tonight. And I'm sure you've heard it before because it's my belief that God has his ways of people hearing, even in the remotest of places. Do you know there are some, I find it me, there are some villages in Africa, they've got no water, they have to go miles for the water, but they've got Wi-Fi, so they can watch Housewives or whatever it's called, Beverly Hills Housewives, Is that, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But God's got a way of getting the gospel to people, of sharing the gospel, and he's gonna give people an opportunity to be saved. There's no reprieve, there's no hope, there's no love, there's no mercy, there's no joy. There is both physical and mental anguish and pain. There is a constant reminder of opportunities for repentance rejected. We even get that in the story of Lazarus and the rich man. There's a heightened awareness of your sin and your failures and regret. And there's no interest in anyone else except for yourself. 
That's what hell is described in the scripture. There's anger and hatred towards God. And everyone in hell will know that God is absolutely real, that Jesus is alive, and that salvation is found in no one else except for Jesus. However, everyone who will be there will be totally, absolutely, and irretrievably unreachable and unapproachable. It's over. And there's no opportunity to come to Christ. Hell is unimaginable darkness, unimaginable torment, loneliness, pain, regret, sorrow, suffering, hopelessness, and fear. And incidentally, folks, I want you to understand this. Hell is not Satan or his demons at throne or home or abode. It's their judgment and their punishment. Satan is not sitting in hell in the fires like we get these images. That's some Hollywood cartoon image. He fears hell as much as everybody else does or should do. In fact, more so because he knows what is coming for him. And that's why he tries to deceive and keep it and keep this message away from the people because he wants as many of Adam's fallen race with him as possible. But our God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit wants none to perish but all to come to repentance and a knowledge of the truth. We have to warn people about the judgment of, to come and warn people there is a heaven to desire and a hell to shun. Please, please, please don't go there. Don't go there. If you're sitting here tonight, no matter who you are, you're watching or listening to this message, I implore you, Paul, when you read some of Paul's writings, you can hear the anguish of his heart as he begs people, I implore you on God's behalf, be on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I implore you, I beg you, be right with God. Repent, believe, and receive from God your forgiveness and your absolute assurance of eternity with him in heaven forever and forever and forever. Where is hell? Well, it's somewhere down. It's down. Scripture references consistently and continually describe going down, down or into the pit or cast into or dungeons. And when Jesus talks, you know, in second um, chapter of Philippians, it says that God gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth and under the earth. And we know scientists can prove this better than anyone else, that under the earth is molten hot, lava hot, exactly as hell is described. Even in the darkest bits, it is down there. It is, it is away from God. It's away from everything that he created to be beautiful. It's out of sight and out of mind for eternity, forever. And forever and forever. It's down there. And finally, and this is the whole purpose of this message, how can we be saved from hell? I want to emphasize with you, I hear people protest, how can a loving God send people to hell? Let me clarify one thing tonight. God sends no one to hell. We condemn ourselves by rejecting his sole means of salvation and deliverance, which is the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his sacrifice, and his subsequent raising from the dead is the only means, past, present, future, male, female, whatever culture, color, creed, or culture you're from, is the only means of salvation and being guaranteed a place with God for eternity. 
Scripture says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but shall have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Those who believe in the name of God's one and only son are saved, but those who choose not to believe are condemned already because they have chosen not to believe in the name of God's one and only son. That verse that I quoted this morning and Stuart repeated, God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He's not waiting for you or me to clean our lives up to come to him. We come to him as we are and he cleanses us and washes us and comes to live in our heart and he starts the process of cleaning us up and preparing us for eternity with him in heaven. It says, repent, believe and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will receive forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and this gift is for you and for your children and your children's children and for all who are far off. Repent and believe, that's all you have to do is repent, turn away, turn around. The Bible says in this gospel of the forgiveness of sin shall be preached to all nations as a testimony to me and then the end shall come. Jesus, um, well, sorry, the apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead, it says you will be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved, it says you will be saved. It's that simple. I was sharing recently, and it amazed me because I've read it a million times, but it just suddenly jumped out of the page at me. The most famous verse in the Bible, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It comes in the midst of a conversation that he's having with a religious man called Nicodemus. And he's just told Nicodemus, you have to be born again. Flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. But in between that and saying, God so loved the world, he says this, just like in the desert when the children of, of, of Israel were bitten by the serpents, Moses lifted up the pole in the desert, the bronze snake, and those who looked at it, looked at it, were instantly healed. Instantly healed. Those who looked at the bronze snake Instantly healed. They just had to look. They just had to glance. Even if it was a final half breath about to expire and they looked, boom, they were healed and delivered instantly by a single glance at the bronze snake on the pole. And Jesus said, just like that, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. All you and I, and you who are listening or watching, all we have to do is repent, believe, and we shall be saved. Saved. Through Jesus and Jesus alone. Looking to him. And this is why when we are out and we're doing our outreaches on Wednesday or weekends or wherever we are, we're not to talk about this and talk about that and get on to issues. Issue-based evangelism just causes division. But Jesus said, when I, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And your job and my job is to lift up Jesus Christ, to point people to Jesus, to share Jesus with them, to bring Jesus into the conversation, to get off church, to get off moral, the moral failures of our society, to get off all of that. I'm not saying we shouldn't, we should stay silent about these things. We shouldn't. And God has called specific people to specific areas. But when it comes to soul winning, it's Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's nobody else. It's only him. Raised up on the cross, it is finished, he said. And when he said that, it was not a cry of defeat. It wasn't just a cry of, oh, it's the end at last. It was, I have finished. I have done it. Born without sin, 33 years, Father. I have lived. I have never sinned. Never had an evil thought, an evil word, or an evil deed. And I have done it. It's been paid for. The sin of all mankind from Adam right up to when God wraps this up. It 
is finished on a cross on Jesus. And when we look to him and believe in him, he is pleased. You know, there's a verse in the Bible. It says this. I love this verse. I love some weird verses. I love this verse. It says, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. When you believe that God sent his son to die on a cross on your behalf, bearing your sins and exchange, giving you his righteousness, God is pleased to save you. Delighted. Delighted. Do you want proof of that? I'll give you proof. Heaven has got a million, 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 million angels. And it says that God in heaven, the whole of the angels of heaven, through a party when one single sinner repents, one single one, a party goes off in heaven because they're more valuable to him than everything else. How do we know? Because he didn't send an angel. He didn't send a deliverer. He sent his one and only son to die. And the risk that Jesus took, have you ever thought about it? The risk that he took, he had known God. He is God. He, God Father, God Son, God Spirit. Three in one, the Trinity. He was God. And had he sinned once during all that time, not just that we would have been lost, Think about that. But he did it. <laughs> he did it. Why? Because he saw you and he saw me today. 2,000 odd years later, he saw us. The Bible says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And then he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. You are his prize. The Bible says, if to those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The scripture says, those who believe in Jesus have crossed over from death to life. It says, he who has a son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Jesus said, in this work and the will of God to believe in God's one and only son. Paul wrote, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. And John wrote, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Peter wrote, God has brought to life, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. He saves. So in conclusion to this message tonight, the promise of heaven is given to those who trust in Jesus. And whilst they too are completely alive and cognitive, their experience in heaven is quite different. Everything listed as the torments and punishment of hell that I listed before is completely opposite experience for those who repent, believe, and confess Jesus as their Lord. And their experience of heaven they are eternally alive with God forever. For the one that you love, though you've not seen him, you believe in him and you're filled with an inexpressible joy. You'll be with him for eternity. There is eternal bliss. There is eternal peace. There is eternal joy. There is eternal health and healing. No sickness, no pain, no sorrow, no crying. And death has completely done away with. There's an eternal river of life, not fire. There's wholeness, spirit, soul, and body. Jesus is our light. There is no sun because God is our light. There's eternal fellowship with God, with the saints, with the patriarchs. You can sit down and have a conversation with Abraham or with Moses or with Joshua. Our loved ones who loved the Lord Jesus and gone on before us, we will be with them forever, for eternity, in the presence of God and light and glory. There is eternal joy that we were saved. I have family in heaven, my mom's in heaven, my sister, I've got at least two sisters 
in heaven and maybe three because my mum had a miscarriage. So I don't know if I've got another brother in heaven, but I'll be with them for eternity. This is not wishful thinking, folks. I'm not trying to hype you up tonight. This is what we're living for. This is what we're hoping for. This is what we're believing for. There's eternal joy that we're saved. Gratitude, eternal hope and living forever. There's the eternal presence of the love of God. They're saturated in it. Have you ever had a time when you've had fellowship with God and you felt so saturated in his presence and his love that you just didn't want it to go away? I remember after we saw that baby raised from the dead in Sri Lanka when we ended up in the the church center down in the town in Sri Lanka. I remember when my wife and I woke up, it was like, and I've mentioned this before, maybe you you might remember when you were a kid, you know, at Christmas time. Now they have these stupid plastic baubles. They're just rubbish. In my days, they used to have glass ones. You remember the glass ones? But every year you'd open the box and half of them would be just in bits, wouldn't they? Well, because they were fine glass. And when we woke up the morning after we saw the baby race and the dead at the crusade, it was like we were in this glass bubble. I didn't want to breathe. I was scared. I was scared to get out of bed in case I just broke this fellowship with God. I had a picture of our awesome Father in heaven. Turning to my wife, did we see that last night? The glory of God. The joy of a mother with her child back. The salvation of an entire family. There is joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's eternal gratitude for Jesus. There's no more pain, no sickness, no evil, no sorrow, no suffering, or anything at all evil. There's nothing. When you and I go to heaven, and the new heavens and the new earth, and I won't get into that tonight, but when we go to heaven, when God wraps it all us, there's nothing evil. There's not an evil thing. Nothing, nothing. Evil, unclean, bad, painful, sick, tormenting, anxiety, nothing. None of it. It doesn't exist. We have eternal peace and joy. There'll be a recounting and remembrance for God's mercy and goodness. There'll be a heightened awareness of all that's beautiful and holy and glorious and godly. We will be utterly devoted to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit and to one another. There will be nothing but love, gratitude, worship, and praise to God forever. We will know God more intimately and personally than we could ever imagine possible. It's the promise. We will be totally, absolutely, completely protected and kept and at peace and safe for absolutely ever, forever, for eternity, forever. Nothing. No pain or sorrow or groaning or mourning or hurt or pain will ever be our experience again because we are in heaven and in glory with God and with Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. The Bible says, things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and which man has not entered, has not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Heaven is unimaginable light. It is unimaginable peace. It's unimaginable comfort and companionship. It's unimaginable gratitude, unimaginable joy, unimaginable wholeness and completeness. It is eternal living hope and experience every single day. It's a new heaven and a new earth with God forever and ever 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 for eternity. Hallelujah. And that's still to come, folks. That's our destiny. It is still to come. That is the promise that we have. When I first preached this message, or a similar message to it, it was in a church in the north of England. And when I finished ministering to people at the front, and the meeting was over. I walked up the, the aisle and two older chaps in their 70s came and met me at the top of the aisle. And they met me and they said, Malcolm, we just want to thank you. We haven't heard preaching like that since we were kids living in the mining communities around here. 
We have never heard preaching like that before. You have to keep preaching this message. I was so blessed. I prayed with them. I hugged them. And then I went through the kitchen. And when I went through the kitchen, a little seven-year-old boy called Noah, pastor's son, came up to me, came up behind me, and this is what he said. Malcolm, that's the best message I've ever heard. And he said, if I wasn't a Christian, I would have become a Christian tonight without a doubt. Seven-year-old and a 77-year-old. Hellfire preaching? Not for today? I don't think so. We need to warn people of the wrath to come and offer them eternal hope through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I remember at one particular time with my wife when I was feeling a bit low and a bit down, she said, Malcolm, you can't give up. We must believe. You must keep preaching the gospel because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. So brothers and sisters, as we ponder the horrors and the sorrow and the unimaginable horror of hell, and we compare it to the unimaginable beauty and glory of heaven and God, we must take this message and take it here first, first, before we take it out there to those who need it. Because it's destined for man to live, to die, and then the judgment. And all who've rejected Christ will be separated from God forever. And all who believed, even in their last dying breath, like the thief on the cross, or the man who had cancer that I read about this morning from the text, all got to be with God in glory. Isn't God amazing? Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes in prayer. Father, thank you this evening just for helping me to communicate this message. Lord, we know it's not a palatable thing. It's not, there's a lot of things in Scripture that we find difficult, but thanks to your Spirit indwelling us and your enablement and empowerment, you help us day by day go from glory to glory and faith to faith. But yet, Lord, when we think about the options of where man and woman will spend eternity, I ask, Father God, for myself, for my brothers and my sisters, Lord, that you will seal, sear, sear this message, or at least the message of heaven and hell in our hearts, Lord. That we will have such a grateful, thankful hearts of gratitude. But that also you will inspire us to go out there into our communities. You'll give us faith. You'll dispel fear. Your word says, we read it this morning, perfect love casts out fear. That you'll dispel fear and empower us and equip us to go out there and share the good news of Jesus with people who so desperately need it. Lord, I pray that none of us will have blood in our hands, but that we will make ourselves available to you. And I also pray, Father God, I pray, Father, for my brothers and sisters as I pray for myself because I know how easy, Lord, it is to get under condemnation and legalism. And that is not the purpose for tonight, Lord. Our purpose is to come before you, to give you thanks, to understand just what a cosmic battle that we have engaged in. And I pray for my brothers and my sisters. And I pray for this church, a church that so faithfully goes out and witnesses every week on the Wednesdays and at weekends and constantly trying to reach people from all different backgrounds and social standings and from the rich man in his fancy Mercedes to the, the addict and those who are struggling. Lord, thank you for the heart of this church. 
Thank you for Arthur and his heart after you and for the lost and for the leadership team here and for the congregation who have put their shoulders to the plow to put themselves to work to reach as many people in their generation and in their sphere of influence as they possibly can. And Lord, may each of us go out here tonight encouraged, equipped, strengthened, inspired. May you sear this word on our hearts. And before we open our eyes, as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I want to give you opportunity, because I don't know everybody who's here, and please don't be embarrassed. You're in the house of God. This is the last place on earth you should be embarrassed to make a response to a message of the gospel. If you're here tonight and you are not sure whether you know Jesus, you're not sure whether you're going to heaven, and something of what I've said has brought you under conviction tonight, and you want to make sure tonight, I want to pray with you. We want to pray with you. So if you're here tonight and you want to get saved, you're not sure if you are, just raise your hand where you are. Just put your hand up where you are. God bless you. Is there anybody else here tonight who's not sure, not certain? Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.